some context, do some introductions, um, and then we'll have uh, maybe a couple of rounds of question and answers with the panelists, and then we will open the floor up for discussion and questions from both the online and uh, offline audiences. Uh, so to begin with, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the Center for Communication Governance, where I work. My name is Aishwarya. Uh, we're an academic research center that's based in the National Law University of Delhi. And so we work across various themes of internet governance. Uh, so things like platform governance um, and intermediary liability, privacy and data governance, emerging technology, AI, cybersecurity, national security, the whole, the whole uh, range. So we do this through a bunch of different ways. So one is we have academic research, then we also have policy inputs that we, that we uh, provide to the government. We also facilitate capacity building of various stakeholders, so government and judicial officers, for example, as well as young policy and legal professionals through things like our fellowship um, at both the international and national levels. So as to why we're here today, um, I think it's fairly uncontroversial to say that social media platforms have, have been linked to a range of harms. Um, and so typically the way that we have addressed these harms through regulation is through intermediary liability um, and basically imposing penalties on platforms, right? Uh, but we're seeing that it comes with its own set of issues. For example, the tendency to over remove content sometimes because of the, the risk of regulation. And also I think increasingly we're finding that it's a more blunt tool and it doesn't really address the root cause of a lot of these harms on platforms, which sometimes are linked to the way that they're designed and the incentives and the structures that they operate within, right? And so transparency is now becoming a core focus of regulatory intervention um, to address social media harms. And so the intention behind these is to know more about platform functioning so that we can more easily address harms and also uh, increase accountability by holding the right players responsible. <clears throat> Excuse me. So although everyone again now broadly seems to agree that transparency is a good thing to have, I think there's a bit of debate on what that would actually mean and how you would actually operationalize it. So what kind of information do we need? Whether the same kinds of information are provided by different kinds of social media platforms? Who the information is provided to? How this intersects with trade secrets and other commercial considerations, for example, are all questions. And then another set of concerns are just about whether the same kind of interventions would apply equally to global north and global south countries because we're seeing that a lot of these regulations are coming from places in the US and the EU um, but these might not apply equally to other countries as well. So what we primarily want to do in this session is to look at what meaningful transparency, transparency can look like and how considerations are likely to be different based on geography and socio-political conditions, right? Um, so I'm going to begin with a quick introduction of, of all the panelists. So we have Fernanda Martins here with me, uh, and the other two are joining remotely. Uh, Fernanda works at Internet Lab, where she works as a coordinator of inequalities and identities, and she focuses on the field of internet policies, within which she's dedicated to gender, ethnic racial relations, gender violence, feminism, political violence, hate speech. Um, she also is a PhD student in social sciences in the State University of Campinas. And, um, a master's degree in social anthropology and a bachelor's degree uh, in social sciences. She's also a two, member of two research centers related to gender that I'm not going to try to pronounce because I am sure I will get it wrong. Um, but uh, that's Fernanda. And Fernanda, maybe we could start with you. And um, I think maybe a good place to start would be to talk about, based on your experience, what some of the most pressing issues that we're trying to address are. So what are the kinds of harms that you're seeing and what do current redressal policies or like processes look like in, in Brazil and maybe the larger Latin American context? Hello everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this panel. It's a good moment to meet and exchange with you. Um, so my name is Fernanda. I am the director of a think tank called Internet Lab based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And this theme bring, brings us so many important thoughts. Um, I confess that I was thinking about what it would be important to be mentioned in terms of Brazil and Latin America. And I concluded that considering the context of challenges to democracies globally, 
it would be important to reflect a little on the experience that we lived in the last few months in Brazilian elections. Um, these last elections uh, made the necessities that we have clearer to us. In terms of harm, we, ha we have been facing problems related to disinformation, political violence, and specifically political gender-based violence. Understanding this phenomenon requires us to deepen the understanding that each of them is connected to another. For example, it's impossible to think about this information without considering gender-based violence. At the same time, it's impossible to think about gender-based violence without considering the dynamic of information. Although we are dealing with different topics, comprehending this from an intersectional perspective allows us to improve our look to the problem. This year, uh, we live it through a process in which the platforms, civil society organization, superior electoral court, journalists, and academy work together to try to improve the combat to disinformation and political violence in Brazil. This process brought challenges, gaps, and the concrete perception that we need more than we had this year and in the others. One of the main points is related to the fact that the harms caused by this phenomenon are not restricted to the election moment. Because of that, the effort to address the impacts of disinformation or political violence can't be limited to punctual actions in punctual periods. Actions involving different social sectors and diverse platforms are always necessary. Still, it occurred in Brazil not only because of legislation, but because we had, at that moment, um, specific people at Electoral Supreme Court, particular teams working on some platforms, and specific researchers looking at political violence and disinformation in civil society and academy. We had a conjunction of factors that enabled us to face political violence and disinformation dynamics as was possible. When the result of the election was divulgated, we started a new process. Part of the Brazilian society defended that the elections were frauded without proof or anything in reality that supported this defense, it is a problem that has yet to be solved. In Brazil, many far-right groups are asking for military intervention. Here, a point caught my attention. Um, part of the efforts conducted during the elections had the presence of Twitter, but after Elon Musk acquired the platform, the dialogue uh, the dialogue doors were no longer open. The example of Twitter is a point to highlight for one reason. The future of democracies in global South countries must not be only in the hands of the private sector, which suddenly could change the owner and consequently the parameters of work that will be developed. Likewise, uh, we should not depend on specific personalities in any sector that centralize how the elections will occur. Because of that, um, the process of maturing legislation to address how we will deal with huge issues such as disinformation, transparency, and political violence should be the center of the discussion. Um, it's to, to start. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you, Fernanda. I think especially what you were talking about um, when you said that basically a lot of these harms aren't restricted only to friction points, things like elections or when mass scale violence, things like that happens, but rather builds over time, I think is really important. And I think that's also why you need larger structures in place so that even if a mask takes over Twitter or something else happens, uh, platforms don't change behavior in like a significant way that affects, um, that affects rights. Um, so, Shashank, if I can come over to you now. Um, Shashank Mohan is um, a project manager at 
the organization that I work at, uh, at CCG. Uh, he works primarily on data protection, data governance, surveillance, intermediary liability issues. Um, and he studies the effect of digitization and the internet on human rights, specifically on the rights to privacy and free speech. Um, so Shashank, if I can ask you a little bit about um, what the goal of transparency would be, right? So for example, Fernanda has highlighted a bunch of things that can happen around election time and the kind of harm that can come from it. So is there anything that we can gain from, uh, f so how do we link these harms to platform information? And so what are some of the challenges that we've seen uh, when you try to operationalize it? We've recently had the IT rules, for example, that have imposed some transparency requirements, which have had limited sort of value. So if you could talk to some of that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ashwarya. Um, and I'm just going to try and break down your question um, and try and answer the first part of it as to, um, you know, what should be certain goals of transparency and then uh, touch upon what are sort of the some of the operational challenges that platforms are facing. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to do um, a bit of cheating here. You know, I'm going to look at, let's say, what the Santa Clara principles lay down when they say Shashank, I think we lost uh, audio. Been sort of endorsed by uh, various companies. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Great. Um, and just remind me where the audio dropped. At the beginning of your sentence, so I think you can repeat yourself. <laughs> No, I was just saying that I am going to, um, you know, use a bit of a cheat sheet here and say that, um, you know, we can look at uh, some of the principles laid down in the Santa Clara principles um, that have been endorsed by various um, private corporations, academics around the world, human rights organizations. Uh, they sort of generally are accepted to mean, you know, uh, um, or, or sort of be endorsed by people who are looking at what transparency should mean. Um, and, you know, I'm just going to say that transparency uh, should lead to a fair, unbiased, proportional um, uh, sort of um, um, experience on the internet and also should respect user rights, right? Very, very sort of broad. Um, um, and the goals of transparency should, um, um, you know, especially in context of a heterog heterogeneous sort of society like India, um, where there are various communities and, um, uh, you know, uh, India is a very sort of community-based identity-related uh, society. Uh, in a sort of complex society like ours, it's very important to understand. Um, I'm, 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 I'm now also sort of specifically speaking to uh, content moderation practices that, um, um, you know, large platform companies uh, employ and deploy is sort of to understand how decisions are made um, when content is taken off or sort of kept on, um, um, you know, being one of the goals of transparency, definitely. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and Ashwara, you were referring to sort of certain sort of uh, regulatory changes that have happened in India recently um, since last year. Uh, one of the bigger changes that uh, have taken place that um, the government has um, asked here for companies to um, you know, on a monthly basis, publish transparency reports. And we've seen certain challenges that have come with that. Um, when I talk about, you know, understanding how decisions are made by platforms on content, um, that has translated through the regulations in India only to mean, um, uh, it means sort of sharing of certain numbers that they do. Um, because of the broadly worded uh, regulation that we have, um, companies have, um, focused on sharing, let's say, takedown numbers or how many sort of uh, uh, complaints they received, how many uh, pieces of content did they take down. Uh, what this regulation uh, has been criticized for uh, is basically not providing the nuance uh, behind, let's say, um, you know, if, if automated tools were, were used to um, uh, take down certain content, um, what were the error rates, let's say, in these tools, what tools were used, how much of that content was reinstated based on complaints, etc. Um, so, you know, tying back to the goals of um, transparency, um, especially Indian regulation has not been able to sort of achieve that. Um, that's sort of one insight I want to point to. Um, and that's where sort of some challenges uh, also arise 
that when government mandates become, um, you know, th th there's a sort of tricky balance. If you're too specific, um, then it may not be flex flexible for various types of organizations to be transparent. When you're sort of more broad based, like the Indian regulation, then you may end up sort of seeing transparency that is not very meaningful. Um, again, I think um, a certain goals um, of transparency um, um, should be sort of to ensure that um, also um, users are getting opportunities for expressing, um, you know, for being heard. Often in India, um, um, either on their own uh, by social media companies or by by, the, by government requests, um, platforms take off content and users are left without any recourse. Um, although there are specific regulations now in India uh, that, that require certain platforms to provide for an appeals mechanism, but we, we, we've seen that that's not enforced very sort of um, ardently. Um, so um, to sort of... Um, Broadly answer your question about goals, um, you know, I'll keep it at that. Um, I'll quickly come to certain challenges that platforms are, you know, are facing to for, for transparency um, or to be transparent, right? Or general challenges that, that uh, make it difficult for uh, transparency to be operational. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I think um, has been, uh, um, you know, sort of the rigidity of business models um currently how uh, the business models that platforms work under it is not always in uh, they're not always incentivized due to those business models to be more transparent um you know their goal is to maximum maximize engagement maximize al eyeballs on on their platform and ensure that um, you know people people continue to use their platform so i think one of the biggest challenges for operationalizing transparency is business models um, I'll address a couple of other challenges is, of course, um, um, you know, when you have, you may need to sort of add nuance to transparency measures, especially regulations. Um, regulations may need to differ uh, from platform to platform. So have certain certain basis, basic principles for all platforms, then also have, have specificity uh, uh, depending on size and, 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 and complexity of platforms. So, um, for example, the transparency you may need from uh, a platform like YouTube may be slightly different from the transparency you may need from a platform like WhatsApp. That that uh, you know WhatsApp being both these platforms being very distinct and being extremely popular in India. Let's say um, that's the sort of second challenge. I, I I you know kind of a challenge I may sort of want to point. Um, the the third challenge I think is also jurisdictional, and we've seen it play out in a. Uh, in, in, in various ways across the world, including India, is that uh, what what are we asking, com what data are we asking companies to sort of collect and be transparent about? Um, um, you know, we, we've sort of, and, and we've seen that um, when sort of demands are made for, for certain laws that may be applicable in a certain country, um, you know, uh, for example, courts have also asked for such, for such a content to be, we take it down, let's say, across the world uh, and apply certain orders globally. So, you know, there are sort of jurisdictional challenges there as well when it comes to transparency, how to apply transparency, how to apply certain measures of transparency uniformly around the world and how to sort of make it more nuanced jurisdiction ways. Uh, but I'll stop there, Shwara, there's, there's much to answer uh, and I'll give it back to you. Well, you've touched on like five different areas I think that we can go to. Um, so I think, I mean, and I guess we'll discuss this over the course of the rest of the session as well. It's just that I think what uh, came through for me when you were talking about uh, the challenges especially was the fact that it's very hard to, or it can be hard to standardize the kind of information that you're asking for from different kinds of platforms while also being specific enough to get the kind of information you need to actually target harms. Um, and so... I mean, that's a challenge, I guess. I guess if you were, if you were able to answer that question over the course of the session, then we would have solved, we would have solved platform governance. Um, but Emma, I'd like to go over to you now. Um, Emma uh, is the director of the Center for Democracy and Technology's Free Expression Project, uh, where she works to promote law and policy that supports internet users' free expression uh, in the United States, Europe, and around the world. Um, she also works with user-generated content services and other stakeholders to develop best practices, including meaningful transparency appeals and remedy procedures. And uh, 
like Shashank was mentioning the Santa Clara principles on transparency, so Emma was deeply involved in the development of those principles, which I know that all of us have been referring to over the course of um, of the last, uh, of this entire transparency conversation. Um, so Emma, if I could just ask you to talk about, I think Shashank mentioned a few of them. So in India, at least primarily, the kind of requirements that we have is to focus on transparency reporting. But what are some of the other kinds of requirements that we're seeing from other regulators around the world? And also to, I think address some of what Shashank was pointing to, how do you then make sure that the information that you're asking platforms to provide is meaningful um, so that we can work, work with them? Great, yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me on this panel. I really wish I could be there with you in person. Um, and yeah, as far as the kinds of transparency that we're seeing come up in regulation, there are, there are a variety of them. Um, there, I think, is more of a recognition now than ever before that when we say transparency, we potentially mean a lot of different things in the policy space. Um, so we often think about things like transparency reports um, that Shashank was talking about. Uh, you know, transparency reporting originally started um, as an industry initiative focused primarily on government demands for um, user data or content restriction that tech companies were facing kind of in countries where they operated around the world. Um, there was a big push from civil society to say, this is, this is potentially a matter of life and death for some people um, to understand if governments are making demands for their personal data um, and, and for restricting their content or deactivating their accounts. So that was sort of the first wave of transparency reporting. Then we saw um, in 2018, following a lot of again, coordinated advocacy from groups around the world, um, companies, uh, at least a couple social media companies start publishing reports on how they enforce their terms of service. Um, those have both been, I think, useful initiatives for giving policymakers a sense of what might this transparency reporting look like. Um, but we're starting to see a lot of focus on particular kinds of transparency reports that regulators want to see. Um, for example, in the Digital Services Act in the European Union, there are um, there will be now obligations for different kinds of service providers to provide that kind of content moderation, enforcement reporting, but also to give really specific information or more specific information on how their algorithmic systems operate um, to do some kind of regular reporting on what sorts of automated tools and systems that they're using, but also what are the kinds of criteria or things that they think about in developing al algorithmic recommendation systems or content promotion tools um, so that people can have a better idea of how not just the sort of take down or leave up decisions are being made by the companies, but try to get more of a view into what is affecting what gets kind of promoted more widely on a service and what might get kind of suppressed or, or removed from view. There's also a lot of focus on reporting um, and other kinds of transparency around advertising in particular. Um, I think it will not surprise anyone in this session that there's been a lot of focus on how online advertising systems, especially things like Facebook's advertising system or Google's kind of advertising network that spreads across the web, um, are potentially used to, uh, for behavioral targeted ads um, and that this can be used to some beneficial extent by a lot of different speakers, but also used in really manipulative ways. Um, so a lot of focus on getting more information about who is posting ads, where the money is coming from, who those ads are being shown to, what kind of targeting criteria are being used, um, because this seems like a really sort of key element of the online information environment that people want to understand a lot better. So that's sort of transparency reporting in general, um, but as Shashank was talking about, there are other kinds of transparency as well, things like user notice, information actually De designed and delivered directly to users about what the content policies are. How can you report abusive content? What can you do if someone has flagged your content for removal or an automated system has taken it down? And how can you appeal that decision? Um, there's This kind of aligns with a lot of what um, was in the Santa Clara principles around just the tools that users need to have, the information they need to have, um, the awareness of where different kinds of functions on a platform even are, uh, are really important to users actually being able to exercise their own rights and enjoy um, or and make decisions uh, for themselves about kind of what services they use and how they use them and take steps to, you know, get their content restored if they think it's been wrongfully taken down. So we do see some legislation. Um, I'm, I've been focusing primarily in the US and Europe uh, and, and often legislation kind of takes up some of this sort of transparency as well. This idea that, yeah, users need a better idea of what the terms of using this website are and that 
publishing a multi-page, very tiny font, long and dense content policy or um, stuffing it into like the general terms of service for a website is not exactly giving users the information that they need. Um, we also see a lot of focus in regulation around uh, audits. Uh, and this is, this is a little new. This is kind of more recent in the past couple of years, this idea of not just trying to get companies to report information, but really wanting some independent third party to be able to verify if that information is accurate, um, to be able to understand what are the processes that a company went through to produce those numbers um, and, and to, to actually do some verification and some checking on what sorts of systems and processes companies have in place, um, how they develop these numbers for their reports, and what the, the kind of descriptive elements or the more qualitative information that they provide, how that actually aligns with the, the real day-to-day -day practice. So that's the whole question of like auditing social media companies and what that looks like and what that means is potentially a whole panel in and of itself. But it is, I think, a very um, interesting area because it, it logically fits into some of the broader conversations around regulation of really wanting to have sort of third party assurance of some of the information that we're getting from tech companies about how they operate. And then the final um, kind of transparency or thing that sort of fits under the transparency umbrella that I'll highlight is the whole issue of enabling independent researchers to have access to data held by tech companies, including social media services and some other kinds of services, um, so that independent researchers can do research on it, can, can ask questions, can do investigations, can try to figure out and test hypotheses about how our information environment operates, how different kinds of interventions or mitigation measures that a company might roll out or that third parties might try to employ on a social media service, are they actually working? What effect do they have? How do they shift what is being said or what information people have access to? Um, do any of the, the proposed solutions that, that people are rolling out either independently or through regulation actually make an impact? Um, it's in my view, it's really crucial to have independent research happening on the information environment. And one of the big challenges for researchers right now, obviously, is that the tech companies are the ones with all the important data to use. And there's a lot of different barriers to getting access to that. Some different social media companies have uh, different APIs, um, tools that researchers can use to kind of access some data. Um, those are often, though, not providing access to the full suite of data that researchers might want. Um, and there can be different kinds of limits and restrictions on how those are used. And these are systems that are happening voluntarily. While I think it's very good that different companies are, are voluntarily trying to work with researchers or provide data or information, it's not a guarantee. And it's also something where we've seen in different high profile cases, sometimes a researcher's access gets revoked and it's not clear why, or there are suspicions that it's because the company doesn't agree with the direction that that researcher is taking their research. So that's a big feature in um, discussions right now, including in the EU's Digital Services Act, to actually start looking at what a structure for requiring different tech companies to make data available to researchers really looks like, um, how to put that in place while still ensuring safeguards for the privacy and security of this data. Um, we've talked to a lot of researchers at CDT and they are hungry to get access to some really sensitive data, including things like the content of private messaging communications. If you're, for example, studying um, extremism and radicalization online and trying to understand what the path towards radicalization might look like for somebody who goes on to potentially commit offline violence, a lot of that interaction happens in the private direct messages or on private um, and even encrypted communication services. And so there's technical questions of whether that content is even accessible. But there are enormous privacy implications about saying that, yes, your private communications could potentially just be exposed to a third party because they have a really good idea of research that they want to do. So there are a lot of different trade-offs to be thinking through. Um, and, and it's something where I think we're going to continue to see a lot of energy and attention, especially around questions like, what data should people have access to? What are the privacy implications of making that data available? What kinds of technical um, transformations to data can you do to make it still useful for research, but, but preserving of people's privacy? Uh, and also who's a researcher? Who actually gets to have access to different levels of data or different uh, data with different sensitivities. Um, a lot of researchers would like data to be publicly available because they don't want to be sort of bound to 
any particular company's decisions about whether to make that data available to them or not. They just want it put out publicly and then kind of no restrictions on what they can do with it. There's a lot of benefit to that, but there's also a lot of potential for abuse depending on what kind of data that is. On the other hand, ideas around saying that researchers must be associated with a, um, an academic institution or an official research institution could really cut out a lot of really important um, independent journalism, research by civil society organizations, or just research by researchers who aren't affiliated with any particular institution. So trying to, there's a lot of different kind of details there um, that are being worked out in a variety of different regulatory conversations. It's one where I really hope that policymakers and regulators can work together and think about developing systems that will work across jurisdictions and worldwide, because if we end up with multiple different standards and rules and, and different sort of regulations or, um, you know, vetting procedures or any of that, it could become very difficult very quickly to actually implement any of these efforts to for researcher access or more broadly for any transparency. And I do worry that then it becomes a, something where companies focus on complying with um, you know, the regulations in the countries that they're most concerned about and leave a lot of other countries um, without the kind of access or information because they're just not, um, not as big priorities. So to quickly answer um, the, this idea of like, how do we make transparency meaningful? I think a lot of it ties into what Shashank was talking about of understanding what are the goals of transparency. We can't just sort of take a one size fits all approach to this. We need to understand for any given proposal about transparency, what is it really trying to accomplish? Who is the audience for this transparency? What kind of information do they actually need? And what's a, a format that's actually useful and gets that information to them as they need it. Um, and then I'd also flag that I think transparency regulation really needs to be, um, or a kind of any transparency initiatives, really need to be iterative. Uh, a big part of why so many of us advocates want more transparency from tech companies is it's really hard to do policymaking when we don't have good information about how companies operate or the effect that they're having on the information environment. And that extends to policymaking about transparency. We can't I don't think today we can say exactly what a good algorithmic transparency report should look like because nobody has really done one yet or there aren't really solid examples or tested examples of where we could conclusively say this kind of information is definitely useful and this other kind of information is, is not useful. I think we're really still in an experimentation phase and so for any policymaker thinking through kind of regulation in this space, I think it has to be flexible and iterative and something where once we get initial information out of companies, we need to feed that back into the process and think about, okay, how does that change or shape what we what we want to ask for next or what the, the regulation should look like two years from now or five years from now? Because I think it will probably change and will hopefully be much better informed from the initial efforts of transparency um, and help that actually improve the policymaking around transparency itself. Thanks, Emma. I think um, what you were saying in the end, especially about the unknown unknowns, is something that we really have to address in terms of transparency. It's hard to, I mean, I guess from a regulator's perspective, it's easy to just say, just give me all the data because uh, because we don't know what's useful yet or like what we want yet. So I think you're right, right that we do need to be prepared for this to be an iterative process. Um, I also think, to, like you said, two of the most interesting sort of things that have come out of this set of regulations has been the focus on audits and researcher access. I know that that's where a lot of useful information can come, but I also am, like you mentioned, they were a little bit nervous about how this would apply across different jurisdictions where there might be different considerations for platforms as well as regulators, um, because there are very real capacity concerns. For example, you need to have, if an audit, for example, is conducted by a regulator, they need to have the capacity to be able to process that level of information as well as the technical expertise to be able to make sense of the data, right? And similarly, in terms of like who you categorize as researchers and how you accredit, for example, universities or whoever else. I know there's a bunch of regulation around that. Um, and provide access also makes a huge difference to the kind of information that you're obtaining from platforms, which will then you know, inform, um, inform future regulation as well. Um, and I think we'll come back to some of that hopefully in the next round. I know we're running a bit over time. So maybe after Chris answers this question, we'll, we'll open it up a little bit um, in case people have questions. Um, but Chris, let me just introduce you first. Uh, 
Chris is a research and policy manager at uh, GNI, and he supports GNI's multi-stakeholder research, advocacy, and shared learning with a particular focus on government laws um, and demands that could authorize censorship and surveillance. So he's written and represented GNI in different international conversations focused on good practices for digital transparency with a particular focus on rights respecting responses to uh, online extremism. So Chris, I know that GNI has been doing a lot of transparency work in general. I know it's also part of the Action Coalition on Transparency. Um, and I know that the work that you do also gives you a bit of an overview across jurisdictions of the kind of regulations that are coming up in the space. So if you could talk a little bit about the work that you do and also about what you're seeing um, that are coming up across, across countries. Thanks so much, Ashwarya, and thank you to my fellow panelists and ACT steering group members and to the MAG and the IGF for putting on this event. Um, I think we've kind of helpfully laid out some of the increasing regulatory consensus that transparency is a response uh, to some of the concerns about online harms and, and um, some of the barriers and, and really global north central conversations that underpin some of the work that brings us together to strive for more meaningful transparency efforts so I will just quickly walk through a couple of different um, multi-stakeholder collaborations that are trying to uh, take action and, and help drive some more work on meaningful digital transparency. Uh, so just briefly, uh, the Global Network Initiative, the organization where I work, uh, is a multi-stakeholder organization. Uh, we're made up of some of the world's leading information and communications technology companies, digital rights and press freedom groups, responsible investors, and academic experts and their institutions uh, with a shared commitment to freedom of expression and privacy in the ICT sector. Uh, this commitment is embedded in the GNI principles on freedom of expression and privacy and corresponding implementation guidelines, uh, which are rooted in international human rights law and informed by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So what this framework does is it provides uh, guidance for companies, uh, ICT companies uh, in responsible decision-making and multi-stakeholder collaboration in the face of potential government restrictions on the rights to free expression and privacy. And it includes some corresponding commitments on transparency. Um, so the principles and IGs call on members to disclose, uh, call on company members to disclose the applicable laws and policies, which could require them to restrict access to content or services, as well as any personal information they collect. And they also call on companies to outline policies and procedures uh, when those demands come in and to share those policies and procedures publicly. Um, and, to, and finally, there's also provisions on notice uh, to users when, uh, when content is blocked or access to services is restricted. So within those broader uh, transparency commitments that are a subset of the GNI framework, uh, the GNI framework was first adopted in 2008. Um, and so in the almost decade and a half of experience uh, of implementing the framework, we have seen some both important progress uh, and some challenges in more effective transparency from ICT companies. Uh, an important piece of the framework is we do note that there's not a one size fits all approach, but I think there's some important markers of progress. And we've also had some really helpful conversations internally about some of the challenges and barriers, uh, including some we've discussed today um, that exist for more effective digital transparency. So just some markers of progress, I think Emma, helpfully laid out uh, the shift from transparency reporting really is a uh, strict focus on government demands um, to more broader reporting on uh, systems and policies and, and, and enforcement of those systems and policies and some more creative transparency mechanisms, um, including uh, more real-time communications about thinking around major events. Um, we've also seen, uh, I think it's, it's a challenging area where there's still more progress to be made um, but we have seen some progress in companies sharing publicly results of human rights impact assessments. Um, and we've also seen companies, uh, GNI leads a project, the Country Legal Frameworks Resource, um, make more efforts to help, uh, help users understand the legal frameworks that might authorize censorship and surveillance uh, demands that they receive. And so the CLFR helps map out some pertinent laws in, in countries where GNI members are present. Um, in this global engagement, I think, you know, some things that have come across that have really been pointed to today already um, is that transparency, again, is a core part of any effective legal, regu regulatory, or other response to concerns about digital harms. But a lot of these discussions are centered in majority world perspectives, and there, there's an urgent need to, to greater consider some of, like Ashwari was walking through what some of the different uh, regulatory proposals that put forth actually mean in practice in different contexts. 
Um, and another thing that can often happen in these meaningful transparency conversations that I've seen, including in some of the smaller expert multi-stakeholder workshops, is we can often get very bogged down by particular barriers and trade-offs to more meaningful transparency, whether that's privacy considerations, trade secrets, et cetera, um, and miss opportunities for collaboration, as well as uh, fail to align the many different actors who are working on these issues. Uh, so given those concerns, GNI has helped work with a diverse group of experts again, including my colleagues that represent the steering group as well, uh, to help build a new initiative called the Action Coalition on Meaningful Transparency. Uh, this Action Coalition is launched under the auspices of the Danish Tech for Democracy Initiative and corresponding year of action. Uh, it's led by a steering group of CSOs from India, Brazil, US, uh, EU, UK, Canada, and South Africa. Um, it also has an arm's length advisory group uh, with representatives from industry, government, and international organizations. Uh, that help inform the steering group's work, but also offer an avenue to share and promote this work. And it's led by a project lead at the Brainbox Institute. And we've had a series of public events and perhaps uh, a key focus of this work is also helping align and, and better uh, clarify existing efforts. So we're also beginning work on a portal uh, to help map the many different actors and initiatives working on meaningful uh, digital transparency. I will put a link to that, uh, to that initiative in the chat um, and encourage folks to sign up who are interested. And I'm also happy to speak a little bit more about some of our specific comments and concerns we've seen on different transparent uh, content regulation approaches with transparency as a core component, but I think I can defer that until uh, we open the floor. Sure, I mean, we did have another round of questions, but I realize we're massively over time. So if anyone has questions at this stage, then please feel free to let me know. Otherwise, uh, yes. Uh, so I'm Arjun uh, from SFLC uh, Digital Rights Organization in India. So thank you for the panel. I think it's been a wonderful discussion. Uh, I had a question which I think goes to the core, which is essentially uh, in implementing the transparency principle within the legal framework uh, that India has, uh, you do not want to over subscribe to the government demands of uh, which may transcribe to being uh, over censorship of uh, information and free speech. So I, uh, my question is, how do you operationalize this transparency principle within the framework without um, subscribing to this uh, over, -censor over censorship issue that may arise? No, as in you mean uh, where there's no transparency about government action on platforms? Is Am I understanding that correctly? Right. Right. Okay, well, Shashank, you all take that since you're our only Indian panelist. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Arjun, for that question. Actually, um, um, yeah, I had written that as one of the things that, uh, you, know, uh, should, should, you know, countries in the global south, when they look at regulation or actually platforms. In the Shashank, sorry to interrupt. Can you just please speak a little bit louder? You're a little hard to hear. Oh, sorry, sorry. Is it better now? Yes. Great. No, I was saying that actually uh, that was a point I had written um, for Global South to consider um, because of the, um, you know, um, and, and, and now I'll specifically speak about India. Uh, India has been increasingly, uh, platforms in India have been increasingly getting government takedown requests. Um, you know, just, just looking at Facebook over the past year, it's been a year on year increasing trend of government takedown. So um, I didn't hear um, Arjun's question correctly, but um, I guess um, um, Ashwarya, what I'm making out from his question is um, that how can we uh, get more transparency about government takedowns? Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's more just how do you um, how do you square transparency obligations with. Yeah, basically, not just government takedowns, but how do you also ensure that you get transparency about government action on platforms? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> what uh, there are two sort of uh, uh, points to make here. What pla platforms can do, 
um and they're, they're a bit tied in india because of the uh, confidential confidentiality requirement that the indian law has on a uh, government takedowns but possibly what platforms can do is ensure um that they give more granular detail about government takedowns uh, so for currently what platforms are reporting is let's say um how many requests they get and you know how many takedowns they act upon um and you know sort of more more sort of broad level numbers um uh, but it'll be helpful for them to give more granular details about um you know what are the subject areas broadly under which uh, takedowns takedowns happen uh, one other thing platforms could do and this is not uniformly applied is ensure that they are communicating um with their users when uh, such requests come and they act upon it and again giving more granular detail not just saying that um hey this post was removed let's say due to a government request uh but saying that you know um as much as permissible what category of uh, content they what what category, category of law they content uh, um or so violated and you know so those kind of details the other thing is of course that um uh, you know indians and indian scholars have been sort of asking from the government is in india is to sort of um uh, you know uh, sort of be more transparent for, uh, uh, about the request they send to social media companies especially um um or, 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 you know for takedowns um this is something that uh, you know will need to change in law currently in indian law there is a there is a soft confidentiality of these sort of requirements there so that needs to change so um, yeah i hope that i answered that question I think um I think Emma had something to say about this as well. So Emma? Yeah, no, I'd be happy to chime in. Um I think it's a it's a really important question and I think important for everyone to recognize that there are definitely kind of abusive uses of transparency obligations as well um that we can see we have already seen different governments trying to use transparency as a way to sort of coerce certain activity out of online services um we're encountering that in the United States including from the uh, attorney general in the state of Texas um using civil investigative demands targeted at Twitter to try to investigate effectively how it came to its decision to remove Donald Trump from its platform um this is pretty widely recognized to be a politically motivated effort um and it you know it, it's framed around transparency he just wants to understand how they made these decisions but when you understand the broader context you can see the the kind of political motivations there um there are actually some lawsuits in the US about some social media regulations passed by the states of Texas and Florida um that are probably going to our supreme court um this year that actually look at this question of is it is it constitutional is it does it comply with the first amendment in the US to actually require tech companies to essentially disclose their editorial processes um so i think there are some real questions and concerns about how transparency obligations could be used to try to basically coerce companies into certain content moderation outcomes um i th on the the government transparency point i think it's really important for all of us kind of as, in civil society um as advocates in these conversations about transparency to raise this point to make sure that we're saying that yes as much as we want transparency from tech companies we also need transparency from governments because if we don't have transparency from both sides about what demands government say they're making and what demands company say they're receiving from government we're really only getting half the story and so far we've really had to depend on the tech companies to provide us this information about government action against our speech online um and it's important that the companies do that and i want to see them continue doing it but it's also something where there's just a real um real lack of reporting and transparency from most governments around the world about how they're using different uh elements of the law to to seek restriction of people's speech or to access user data um so i i think that would be a good message for advocates around transparency to always carry along that it's not just company transparency that we're looking for but also government transparency chris i just saw your hand up did you want to pitch in as well Yeah and I think really just echoing Shashank's and Emma's points but one quick thing I failed to mention in my earlier intervention is part of GNI's collaboration also includes sort of multi-stakeholder advocacy and so we did put together a content regulation policy brief that surveyed a number of different regulatory efforts to address online harms um around the world and put forth some human rights based recommendations 
And I say that because I think one thing that's come up that's part of this theme is oftentimes there can be really, you know, thoughtful or or aspirational transparency measures that we would want to see uh, in different regulatory proposals that are also part of much broader packages that have a lot more restrictive designs, whether that's broad definitions of content that could be subject for removal, overly strict enforcement, et cetera. And so that can be a tough thing to balance where you have, you know, requirements for a company to improve their reporting in a more regular basis that are also paired with a quick 24 hour takedown requirement and really broad definition. So I think that's just a wedge that we have to battle, but not one to say that, uh, to discourage us from continuing to push for transparency as a core and effective approach. And I would also echo the government transparency piece. I think even in, um, even in Global North countries, you're seeing instances where some of the new mechanisms that are set up for regulation and enforcement, um, whether that's uh, regulators tasked with putting together codes of conduct or um, other different sort of co-regulatory mechanisms, sometimes there's not a burden on the regulator to report to the public or some of the reporting requirements the companies face aren't even necessarily public, but maybe directly to a regulator. Um, and so those types of mechanisms, while they can be promising, should still also have opportunities for iteration, like Emma was mentioning earlier. And, and, and it's really important that we do continue to hammer home uh, those sort of regulatory design questions um, about government transparency. If not, we risk, you know, creating model examples that more restrictive governments can easily point to. Um, and yeah, so that I just wanted to echo the government transparency piece and flag um, that there can be really thoughtful transparency measures in larger, more restrictive content regulation packages. Thanks, Chris. Um, there's one question, I think, specifically that's uh, for Fernanda. Uh, so Nidhi asks if there are specific differences you see between Global North and South approaches to transparency. In the context of Brazil, was there any contextual issues uh, which the general trends of transparency do not address? Thank you. Um, I think this question opened different avenues to, to think about Brazil and to think about uh, Latin America. So... I think uh, it's important to to uh, look at the difference between the countries in, in Latin America because we have um, a history um, that is contaminated uh, with the fact that our democracies are almost in crisis all the time. <laughs> so when we think about transparency in, in Latin American countries, we need to, to think to, there is a difficult to, um, to conduct the, deba the debate about transparency and what we are considering transparency or, or what we are considering um, disinformation or political violence in the region. Um, so, obviously, uh, we have some, some uh, points of the discussion, it is uh, similar with the uh, Global North, but at the same time, we need to identify, for example, that uh, in Latin America, the concentration of media and concentration of uh, TV, radio and social media, it's not a, a new reality. Um, we need to consider the fact that um, when the regulator debate uh, started in the last years in Latin America, we are talking about disinformation mailing. And this discussion opened other points that it's important to consider. So we have a lot of uh, worries because these these uh, bills in countries as Brazil, Chile, Costa Rica, Argentina, Paraguay, also um, have requirements around content moderation or about rules for public agents, but at the same time, they focus on punishment. And when we talk about countries that has a history of censorship, uh, we need to consider uh, the importance of uh, the balance between transparency, uh, the balance uh, related to transparency, um, 
the privacy of the users and the necessity to defend freedom of expression. And this context demonstrated to us in the last years that in Latin America, we need to uh, think more specifically, deeply, our, our reality because it's not occurring at this moment. We don't have a uh, space to think about it. So we need to go with steps uh, to back and think about these questions um, profoundly. Yeah, I think that's really important sometimes that we forget that <laughs> we're not always at a situation where we can just enforce transparency, but we need to have conversations that build up to actually what that means and how you frame it in a way that protects rights, especially in, in places where that's not maybe the norm. Um, I can see that Shashank and Joanne have their hand up. Uh, Shashank, did you want to come in first and then maybe Joanne? Um, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to make two quick points. Um, 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 sorry, I'm not being able to switch on my video because of uh, bandwidth uh, um, uh, problems at my end. Uh, but I, I was just saying that, you know, there are two developments in India that are, um, that may be promising, especially when we look at, um, uh, you know, the gov influence um, government has on, on content online. One is that, um, you know, one social media company, Twitter has challenged government takedowns before, um, a sort of regional high court in India, um, challenging it on the grounds that, um, uh, you know, they, they have not given enough details, uh, and, 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 the sort of requests may be, um, um in, in, uh, illegitimate in certain instances and not as per law. Um, and, and, you know, uh, this is an interesting instance. I think it's the first instance in India where a, a private company has challenged um, government takedown orders in courts. Um, and, you know, we'll have to see what comes out of that. The other thing is that, um, as I was saying, um, by, by law in India, government takedowns um, are sort of confidential in nature. Um, but they, in, they include a mechanism where the originator of the content should be given a hearing. Um, and we see often that that doesn't take place. Um, uh, the, the, this hearing, uh, the government does not give a hearing to the originator. Um, but in, in an instance before a court, for the first time, um, a court has requested the government to provide a hearing and provide details of why a particular uh, website was taken down. So I just wanted to chime in uh, with those two uh, examples as well as years of efforts by various a uh, civil society organization and academics are maybe giving fruit and the needle may, may be shifting towards transparency slightly even uh, in India. Uh, just wanted to make that point, Ashwarya. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, Joanne, did you have something? I just wanted to point to the second question in the chat, which might um, be interpreted as some of the incentives, I think, for transparency, especially well, with platforms. Read out the question and then any of the panelists who, who want to can uh, can take it. So it says, how is transparency feasible and achievable in an environment where you have owners of technology and users of technology? Don't we see this principle favoring the technical gurus? And how do we create a fair ground for transparency? Does anyone want to take that? <laughs> Well, so one thing, if I'm understanding the question correctly, one thing that this makes me think of is the, the conversation we had a little bit about um, auditing and that, that idea of third party assurance of the information, right? That there, and I think we're, we're sort of seeing across different regulatory conversations about tech transparency, a bit of this recognition that right now, a lot of the people who understand how technical services work work within companies, you know, running and, and creating and um, administering those systems, and that it's very possible that we will get information out of those systems that either regulators or users 
don't really know what to do with or don't really understand what to do with. It reminds me a little bit of how I'm glad that conversations about like algorithmic transparency have mostly shifted away from saying, show us the source code, because frankly, most regulators and users will not know what to do with a big pile of source code, even if it were provided, you know, in clear text to them. Um, so I think what, as we think about making meaningful transparency out of all of the information that's being um, sought from tech companies, we need those translators. We need people with the technical expertise who can help us ask the right questions, figure out what are the, you know, what are the different points to prod or to, to ask follow-up questions or to interpret the information that comes out. Um, because, and I think there are a lot of public interest technologists out there who are very eager to be involved in that sort of thing and, and to work on that sort of thing. But it's a really important recognition in this question that there is an opportunity if the transparency conversations go the wrong way for all of this to just turn into kind of a box checking exercise where companies drop a lot of technical data that's hard for regulators to parse and everyone outside of companies is like, well, I guess I guess they must be doing an okay job. Um, I don't think that's an outcome that any of us really looking for, including companies, because then it's just a really useless exercise. Um, but we do need to make sure that regulators are building up the expertise um, and staffing appropriately to actually conduct the oversight that we hope goes along with transparency. Thanks, Emma. Yes. Um, I think it is a, a really good question. Um, in the perspective of global self, um, the transparency, it's a, it's a thing that we can uh, consider uh, as a umbrella concept, because when we talk about transparency, we are talking about uh, hate speech, about content of moderation, about uh, data for hit searchers. So I don't know if, he, if he, it is a thing that favoring the technical gurus. I think uh, depends on the, the way that we uh, signify the, the concept and what we will do with this data. So it's important to consider the dynamics of power and how in different countries we have different relationships with the platforms. In this case, for example, I think Brazil is very privileged because we have many offices of the platforms and uh, the contact direct with these, um, these teams, but at the same time in countries, um, um, in, in neighborhood of Latin America, the context change uh, suddenly when we uh, cross the, the frontier. So um, the importance to think about uh, a way to consider the region entire region and not just countries separately, uh, maybe it's a way to construct, um, construct uh, a transparency and signify the transparency in the way that we not to, um, we not to give data for governments for censorship, but to uh, improve the way that we construct, for example, public policies and the comprehension about dynamics as disinformation, hate speech, political violence. So it depends uh, how we will do the, the avenue of this construction. Well, I know we're already over time, but I also know that uh, there was another round of questions that we didn't get to. So I just want to give all the panelists a chance to quickly closing remarks, like a minute tops, and then um, and then we can close. No pressure if you don't want to talk, that's fine too. But I just want to make the space available. Well, then I guess we're we're good to close. I just wanted to highlight a couple of themes that um, that seem to have come up over the course of this discussion. So one is just the need to develop enabling frameworks to have a conversation that is meaningful on what kind of transparency would be useful. Um, the second is on the fact that any transparency regulation 
is likely to be iterative. And as we get more information, we ask for more information, we tailor regulation, and that's just generally to be expected, even though it might not be the most efficient way to do things. And the third, I think, that really came out is also the importance of like also applying transparency mandates to governments and making sure that we're also able to obtain uh, data related to government use of platforms. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending and also specifically to the panelists for, uh, for sharing your expertise with all of us. Um, have a great rest of your day. Recording in progress. <laughs>